yourself and excellent mole. Oh, we're all right, replied the rat. Mole, he added incautiously, is going out for a run around with the badger. They'll be out till luncheon time, so you and I will spend a pleasant morning together, and I'll do my best to amuse you. Now jump up there, a good fellow, and don't lie moping there on a fine morning like this.
his friend's side as far as possible, could not help saying, You've been a bit of a duffer this time, Ratty. Toe, too, of all animals. He did it awfully well, said the crestfallen rat. He did you awfully well, rejoined the badger hotly. However, talking won't mend matters. He's got clear away for the time, that's certain. And the worst of it is, he'll be so conceited with what he'll think is his cleverness that he may commit any folly. One comfort is, we're free now, and needn't waste any more of our precious time doing sentry go. But we'd better continue to sleep at Toad Hall for a while longer. Toad may be brought back at any moment, on a stretcher, or between two policemen, so the badger, not knowing what the future held in store, or how much water, and of how turbid a character, was to run under bridges, before Toad should sit at ease again in his ancestral hall. Meanwhile, Toad, gay and irresponsible, was walking briskly along the high road some miles from home. At first, he had taken by paths and crossed many fields and changed his course several times in case of pursuit. But now, feeling by this time safe from recapture and the sun smiling brightly on him and all nature joining in a chorus of approval to the song of self-praise that his own singing to him, he almost danced along the road in his satisfaction and conceit. Smart piece of work that, he remarked to himself, chuckling, brain against brute force, and brain came out on the top, as it's bound to do. Poor old ratty, my, won't he catch it when the badger gets back. A worthy fellow ratty, with many good qualities, but very little intelligence and absolutely no education. I must take him in hand some day and see if I can make something of him. Filled full of conceited thoughts such as these, he strode along, his head in the air, till he reached a little town where the sign of the Red Lion, swinging across the road halfway down the main street, reminded him that he had not breakfasted that day, and that he was exceedingly hungry after his long walk. He marched into the inn, ordered the best luncheon that could be provided at so short a notice, and sat down to eat it in the coffee room. He was about halfway through his meal when an only too familiar sound approaching down the street made him start and fall a trembling all over. The boop boop drew nearer and nearer. The car could be heard to turn into the inn yard and come to a stop. Toad had to hold on to the leg of the table to conceal his overmastering emotion. Presently, the party entered the coffee room, hungry, talkative, and gay, voluble in their experiences of the morning and the merits of the chariot that had brought them along so well. Toad listened eagerly, all ears for a time. At last, he could stand it no longer. He slipped out of the room quietly paid his bill at the bar, and as soon as he got outside, sauntered round quietly to the inn yard. There cannot be any harm, he said to himself, in my only just looking at it. The car stood in the middle of the yard, quite unattended. The stable helps and other hangers-on being all at their dinner. Toad walked slowly round it, inspecting criticizing, musing deeply. I wonder, he said to himself presently, I wonder if this sort of car starts easily. Next moment, hardly knowing how it came about, he found he had hold of the handle and was turning it. As the familiar sound broke forth, the old passion seized on Toad and completely mastered him body and soul. As if in a dream, he found himself somehow seated in the driver's seat. As if in a dream, he pulled the lever and swung the car around the yard and out through the archway. And, as if in a dream, all sense of right and wrong, all fear of obvious consequences seemed temporarily suspended. He increased his pace, and as the car devoured the street and leapt forth on the high road through the open country, he was only conscious that he was toad once more, toad at his best and highest, toad the terror, the trust.
Spring. 
prisoner in the remotest dungeon of the best guarded keep of the stoutest castle in all the length and breadth of merry England. All right. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that you enjoyed chapter six of The Wind in the Willows. Toad has really gotten himself into quite the predicament. <laughs> Thank you again.